started. Um, thank you to everyone who's come already. I know everyone's really busy with work and um, studying and trying to plan an elective as well. So I appreciate it is a Wednesday night. So thank you for your time. Um, hopefully we will make it useful for you and you can take something away from today. Um, the event's also recorded. So if any of your friends like missed out and wanted to um, hear about the talks, um, it should be available on the DEA UK website. Um, and we can put some of the slides up and stuff so they don't miss out. Um, <clears throat> so my name's Penny. I'm one of the DA UK representatives. I'm on the committee. Um, only joined recently, actually. Um, so yeah, that's me. I go, I go to Leeds University. I'm in my fifth year um, now. I did a master's of research, so I integrated, and then I did my elective in Thailand, and I did it in six weeks of surgery. So I'm actually interested in vascular surgery for those of you who don't know me. So I quite like that. It's very niche specialty. So if you've got any questions relating to my talk, well, there'll be a Q&A at the end where we can answer all of your questions as well. Um, Anna, do you want to introduce yourself as well? Yeah, hi, I'm Anna Sixton. I'm a med student lead for the Doctors Association UK. Um, I've been part of the DUK for about gosh, like two and a half years now, which has flown by. Um, yeah, really excited to talk about my elective. I just came back from it this September, not September, sorry, August. Um, I went to the Caribbean, St Vincent and the Grenadines, for a month doing a more medical focused elective. Um, so yeah, you'll be hearing all about that. And Nikki? Hi everyone, I'm Nikki. I'm also a final year at Manchester. I'm not part of the DA UK, but I know Anna from med school and I've worked with Penny before as well. So um, I did my elective same time as Anna because we're in the same year um, and I was in London for it. So I did a bit of a mismatch mix of a lot of different things that I'll tell you more about in the um, in the talk itself. But it was a mix of kind of psychiatry and medical journalism broadly. Brilliant. I feel like we've got I feel like we've got a good balance here because we've got me doing surgery, Anna's done medical and then Nikki's done something completely different and to do with medical journalism, which I think is amazing. So hopefully we'll enjoy the talks today um, and if so, give you some ideas for what to do for your own elective. Um, so we'll get started now. I know people are trickling in, um, but it is all recorded anyway, so you can come back and look at anything you missed out. Um, so, yeah, so that's who our speakers are today. So what's going to happen is I'm going to talk first about um, going to Thailand and doing surgery there. Then Nikki will talk after me. Um, and then Anna's going to tell you about her elective in the Caribbean. Then you're going to come back to me again and we're going to talk about um, the real ins and outs of funding your elective. So I'm going to talk about the actual costings and also where you can go for like funding and just some generic ideas that you might not have thought of by yourself. Because um, I know it varies like how much help you get from medical school to medical school about how much funding you get and things. So just really to point you in the right direction as well. Um, and then we'll finish with some DA UK stuff at the end. So that's where we're going to go with the talks today, guys. So hopefully it won't take longer than an hour. I'm hoping to not waste your time too much. OK. OK, so I'm Penny, as I've already introduced myself. I'm a fifth year medical student at Leeds University. Um, I decided to do my elective in Bangkok in Thailand. Um, fun fact about me, I'm actually 25% Thai, so that's why my surname is so long and confusing. My surname is Citrical, so my father was half Thai and my grandfather was fully Thai. Um, so that's why I wanted to go back to Thailand, sort of reconnect with my roots, to learn the language a bit more. Um, so that's mainly why I really had a real urge to go back to my roots and to go to Thailand. Um, but yeah, so what I did was I wanted to do a six week surgery elective. Um, so I applied for the Ramathi Body Elective Exchange Programme, and that essentially is you can choose any two weeks, any time in the year of any specialty of your choice. So it doesn't have to be surgery. Um, so I know some of my friends did two weeks in emergency medicine there and then did two weeks at a different hospital, say in northern Thailand or just travelled for two weeks. Um, so it's really it's a really flexible programme to sort of tailor to your own interests. And they understand that people you know, have flights or cannot come in certain days or are wanting to do certain activities. So um, if you are thinking about Thailand or you just wanna have a quick look about what I did, um, you can Google the Malhidol elective um, program and it will basically show you all of the placements that are available, you know, emergency medicine, pediatric surgery, et cetera. Um, so what I did is I wanted to do six week block. So I did two weeks in pediatric surgery, two weeks in cardiothoracic surgery and two weeks in orthopedics. And I can tell you it was the best choice I ever made. Um, I'm so happy that I went there and that I just thought, right, let's go abroad. Let's take this leap. Let's 
go to a country where I, I didn't know the language as yet. Um, so it was a really big leap for me, and but I'm really happy I did do it in the end. So um, if you're stuck completely for ideas, but you are wanting to go abroad, um, definitely search this programme up. Um, they will treat you very well. The um, team is incredibly responsive, the admin team. Um, they will help you out with the paperwork and stuff. So if you've not got any ideas, this is the place to go. Um, and the picture on the right is me with my Thai friends that I made over there. Um, so this is between um, scrubbing in for surgery. I made some friends. Um, these are the fourth year medical students um, who have very vigorous timetables of their own. And behind is actually the student dorms. So that's they actually all live together and things as well. So they're all it's quite a close knit group, but incredibly friendly. Um, they all they study medicine in English as well. So actually, the English is really good. Um, most of them speak, you know, very, very well. And you can have a conversation with them and they can understand you. And, you know, you can share stories and things. So it's a very good place to make friends as well. So what does a typical day look like for me? Um, so I, I had to commute an hour into the hospital because I was living with my family at the time out there. So I would wake up at 7 a.m. I would have a breakfast such as like mango and sticky rice, which is quite common in Thailand. Um, I'd have Thai fruit. So in the fruit I've got there, that is a mangosteen, the purple one, which I'd never tried before, but it, you can only find it in Thailand. So fun fact. Um, and the one next to it is actually a custard apple. So if you knew that, I'll be very, I'll be very happy for you. Very excited. Um, and actually, it does taste like custard and an apple. But anyways, new things. Um, and then I would catch the Sky Train, which is how you get around Bangkok. There's a, a little train, and you, it's a bit like the underground, but except it's 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 in the sky. It's hard to explain, but there you go. So I got on the Sky Train. So I was a real commuter for a few weeks, for six weeks. And um, so I'd end up at the hospital about nine a.m. And so how the day would work out is generally we'd see the patients before surgery, so with their relatives, and these consultations would be in Thai. Um, obviously, the main the major language in Thailand is, is Thai, so all the consultations were in Thai. However, the doctors and surgeons would explain things to me in English, um, so that was okay. Um, and then I would scrub into theatre with the juniors and assist where I was able to under supervision, and then the lead surgeon would also scrub in after the juniors had sort of got a bit through the case, which was quite interesting. It's kind of a different dynamic here as the consultant sort of always present. Um, so that was interesting. Um, then I'd have lunch in the canteen where it was just 50 pence for a bowl of noodles, which I was shocked about. And it was 80 pence for iced coffee. So I had a really good time eating in the canteen, eating really good food every day. Um, and then in the afternoon, I would scrub in again or I would go to ward round at 3 p.m. And that would be with all, all the juniors, basically the same as here. We'd go around each of the patients that was seen or operated on or due to be operated on. Um, and then 5 p.m. I'd probably get the sky train home and jump in the pool to cool off because it's very, very hot in Thailand. Um, something that I didn't realise is how exhausted the heat would make you when you go to a different country, especially as I flew in two days before my elective. So my clock was still the other way around. So if I was to do this again, I definitely you know, give yourself a little bit more time to acclimatise than I did because working and being on holiday in a different country is very different. Like you need to give yourself a little bit more time. Um, so the other activities that were on, there was medical student teaching, which was all in English. It's the same kind of teaching as we have. Um, the stems of the questions were sometimes in Thai, but if you ask nicely, sometimes they translate for you, which was good. Um, and there's an on-site gym, which you can use. You could use the badminton courts. You could use the gym facilities. That was really cool. Unfortunately, there was no pool at the hospital, which was the only downside, but there was an air-conditioned gym. So that was good. Um, there was also some conference days uh, that you could get involved in and also some out-of-hours work. Um, now, because of my risk assessment, I wasn't allowed to do out-of-hours work. That's just my university policy, but it might be something that your university allows or that you wanted to do. Um, so a lot of emergency work did happen at night like with trauma cases and stuff that I wasn't able to be involved in. So here are some cool pictures. So on the left, this is my superstar, Dr. Am, who was my pediatric surgery mentor. And it was really amazing because um, a lot of the team you can see, and on the right, this is the pediatric surgery team, and they're quite a close knit team. And a lot of them are like female, actually. So that was quite an interesting dynamic. Like I've never been led by like a senior junior female team and then a senior female consultant. So that was pretty interesting. Um, they were really friendly, really amazing. Um, you can see I got these pink scrubs and that was because um, on day one, I turned up uh, with a cotton uh, white lab coat because that was in the dress code. 
Um, but I was so hot, I was sort of swaying from side to side, trying not to like pass out. Um, it is hot. So if you are going to that side of the equator, you need to get like these lightweight silk scrubs and not wear like polyester or anything like that because you will be sweating. And I found that out pretty quickly. So um, the team very kindly bought me a pair of uh, like silk scrubs. So that's what they all wear here. Um, just to cool themselves down a bit because you're walking about the hospital as well and some parts of the hospital aren't air conditioned so yeah just keep that in mind um, but yeah I had a really good time with the team uh, I was able to watch um, like port cath insertion um, I saw a h-type fistula being operated on like you know amazing things that you think wow I'd never actually see that in practice I got to see the patient in clinic I then followed them into pre-op assessment and then saw the surgery or the diagnosis of the condition and then followed them up in the ward round. So there was a lot of continuity of care, which, which was just amazing. Um, and I'd say the ethos of teaching is definitely um, there in the hospital. You know, people want to teach you. If you turn up, people are saying, right, get scrubbed in, get, you know, what you're doing. They ask you questions in a really nice way. And they, if you're examining like babies on the, ne on the neonatal ward, they'll put your hands exactly where they need to be. Like they'll make sure you're examining, uh, examining in a proper way, which was, it, it was great. Honestly, I had such a, a great teaching experience and I learned so much. So in my cardiothoracics placement, this is the cardiothoracics team. Again, they look very young and very, with it, very smart people, these were. Um, so on the left, this is one of the consultants I met. So he is one of the famous heart transplant surgeons in Thailand. So he actually transplanted the first mechanical heart in Thailand, right? So that was amazing. And um, so he's teaching surgeons he's training surgeons in Thailand how to implant hearts as well so yeah it was just amazing hearing about his life story and of course he was really happy to meet me because he'd actually he'd done his, some of his training in Imperial and St Thomas's and Guy's Hospital so he he just loved hearing somebody like from the UK just to like relate about the NHS and things and to just hear about his career was just really motivating for me as someone who wanted to pursue a career in surgery um, and the cafe here is actually called Ped Pet and pet pet in Thai means spicy, spicy. So you can imagine my shock when um, they ordered the food. It was very, it was, I can say it was authentic. So if you ever get invited out to authentic food, it will probably be spicy in Thailand. Um, so yeah, so you can see that these are all the people that I went out with. So I just wanted to talk a bit about learning the language here. Um, because I was part Thai, I was probably more motivated to learn the language. So I actually had Thai lessons before I did my elective to have some of these conversations that I did with patients. But this is just to say that you don't necessarily need to learn the language. You don't need to speak a language fluently to have it help you on your elective. Even just saying, does it hurt or where does it hurt in your language of choice? That can go such a long way into building rapport with a patient. Um, but yeah, I didn't have many problems with the languages. You know, sometimes I had to go, oh, look, I just, I didn't quite get that. Can you explain that to me again? Um, but, you, you know, people are very understanding. They're happy to explain things to you. And all of my colleagues who spoke no Thai got on okay in the hospitals and had lots of fun. So that's just to reassure you that you don't have to be from somewhere or speak the language to necessarily have a good time. But then again, if you want to, and you're interested in learning a new language, you can, like I did, try and read this complex language. Um, it's, it's quite hard to learn, but it's um, it was good fun and it was definitely a challenge for me, but I can safely say that my tie is a bit better now, so that's a positive. Um, and apart from all the elective and hospital stuff, that you've got to make time for some travel. So on the left is me meeting some elephants at the elephant sanctuary um, where there's no riding or things allowed like that. Um, so we just fed them for like half a day and that, that was really cool. So definitely get out and do some traveling. Um, I also kept fit with a bit of Mai Tai. Um, if you don't know me, I'm like quite an avid martial artist. So I just love all things, hitting things and stuff. So this is me training at a famous Muay Thai gym in Bangkok. And also this is me with my dad on the right, visiting some of the temples and just giving merit and paying res respects to the Buddhist temples and Buddhist ways. Um, so that was, it was, it was so the whole trip was like professional, professionally enriching, but also like spiritually enriching. Um, and I came away from it with just like a whole new attitude and a whole new like, view on life and this whole other world that existed without me. Um, so just a reminder that sun cream and DEET spray is your friend. Do not go into the jungle like, like I did without any DEET spray, you will end up with marks like these. So this is actually my leg after I went into the jungle. Um, yeah, I, I still don't know what bit me, but it probably wasn't very nice, but um, they, they did go away after a while, so I was okay. Um, just so you know, you don't need malaria prep a prep unless you're going into certain areas of Thailand 
probably shouldn't have been in the jungle, but hey ho, we got lost and I didn't know where we were going. So we ended up somewhere in the jungle. Um, and there's also various creatures around that you that may or may not be your friend. So down here is like um it's like a monitor lizard, um, and they're just roaming around Bangkok. Like you walk through the park and there's just there's just these lizards around. Like there's no cage or anything. They can literally just come up to you. And they're, they're quite venomous as well. So you tend to just leave them alone. And I also saw a bit, this is a picture I took in the jungle of a golden orb spider. They can catch birds. And I only found this out after I'd walked through that jungle. So, you know, just be prepared for the things that can come up. Um, but yeah, that's me, you guys. And um, if you have got any questions about how um, I specifically funded my elective and stuff like that. I have got an, a slide on funding in a sec after we hear the other talks. However, if you want to talk to me like specifically about like personal things or you just want to ask me a few questions not in front of everyone, feel free to like message me on Twitter or on uh, email. I'm very happy to answer your questions. Um, I'll get back to you when I have some time. So thanks for listening, guys. I'll hand you over to Nikki next for her talk. Thank you, everyone. Oh, thanks, Penny. Um, I'm going to also share slides that it's literally just photos because I'm quite simple, but <laughs> no worries. Just let me know if you have any problems. Well, hopefully it'll Brilliant. be okay, but I can see it. I can see it. Okay. Brilliant. Brilliant. Go ahead. Okay. So in case anyone missed the beginning, I'm Nikki. I'm a final year at Manchester and I did my elective um, in a mixture of things, but I was based in London for my elective. So I originally knew that I wanted to do a placement that kind of encompassed my interests. So for me, clinically, that's psychiatry and non-clinically, that's kind of journalism, leadership, policy, funding, things like that. So that for me quite quickly narrowed it down to wanting to be somewhere English speaking because psychiatry consultations aren't like surgery where you can kind of not understand what's going on. Um, so I did originally explore like some avenues looking into America and Canada but last year they had kind of a blanket no um, international students policy due to COVID um, that might have changed now so if you are interested in um, countries like America and Canada I would definitely look into it again so I kind of began exploring my options within the UK which ended up working out quite well for me because it meant that I was still able to kind of honour prior commitments and meetings that I had um, so broadly speaking, I had two kind of clinical weeks and two non-clinical weeks out of my four week elective with like the odd day doing kind of different meetings or recordings and things like that. I should, um, the, oh, this was a slide that I meant before. There we go. I should probably mention that kind of for a bit of context, I took a year out from med school. And I didn't do, um, and it, I didn't intercalate. I worked full time for the BMJ. Um, where I was in charge of running the student section of the journal, but also kind of writing, editing and hosting their podcast. But I was also given a huge amount of kind of journalism training. Um, and this was during COVID. So the pace of like medical journalism at that time was <laughs> crazy. Um, so when planning my elective, one of the things that crossed my mind was the fact that I'd been lucky enough to have all of this exposure and this quite specialized training. Um, in journalism, writing and using podcast mediums. But I had this huge gap in my knowledge in terms of TV or broadcast journalism. And as med students, we don't really get a whole lot of time, or free time or funding to be able to do things like unpaid internships or kind of explore any other interests that we have. So I thought the elective might be a good time for me to explore some of these interests that I've got that I kind of I always describe them as running parallel to medicine because they're not clinical but they're not completely separate so for me that that was health journalism I spent my year at the BMJ kind of devouring all of the medical news like a literal loser I would sit and watch all of the health segments from all of the different news broadcasters um, and it kind of became my little niche or my area of interest and by doing this you kind of naturally get a favorite presenter or a favorite news channel um, and mine kind of became channel four um, so I ended up kind of taking a bit of a shot in the dark and I reached out to the team at channel four news explained my kind of situation my background the training I'd had and the time I had free which was literally just these four weeks 
um, and I just kind of asked if I could work with them or work for them and to my absolute surprise it all kind of fell into place and I ended up spending two weeks working with their health and social care team and I helped plan and produce stories I went out with them to film things I saw John Major the old prime minister giving evidence at the old blood at the blood inquiry which was such a cool experience in itself because it was a press conference where for me who'd been sat watching all the different health um, journalists I'd watched BBC ITV I was sat in a row next to the BBC presenter and the ITV presenter and we were all kind of watching the same thing and then that night I went home and I watched all of the new segments and how everyone covered the same story again it's one of those things that it really interests me it might not interest you um, but I learned so much about live TV and visuals and things that I'd never really even thought about before um, but I guess one of the reasons I've always been so interested in health journalism is, is because of how important it feels to me for us to understand how the general population, who will be our patients, perceive not only our profession, but their own health and the policies and the politics and the kind of funding that impacts all of that. I actually loved my time at Channel 4 so much that I ended up going back and spending an extra week in my summer. But I actually, I think the only free week I had in my summer going back there. And actually, I think it's Channel 4 News's 40th birthday tonight. So after this talk is finished at eight o'clock, go back and watch their news, their seven o'clock news tonight on Plus One. <laughs> but the other two weeks of my elective were by no means any less exciting. Um, so my clinical supervisor was... Um, Dr. Derek Tracy. He's a consultant psychiatrist and he's medical director of West London's NHS Trust. Um, and he's someone who I've been really lucky to kind of call a mentor and I've worked with over the past four years or so after so someone I met at a conference when I was in second year. But because he was medical director of the trust, I was able to spend each day of these two weeks at different sites. So I was able to explore a variety of different psychiatric subspecialties particularly ones that we really don't get to cover at med school, such as perinatal psychiatry, liaison, went to medium and high secure forensic units. I even went to Broadmoor, which is obviously one of the most famous um, high secure forensic units. And it, it was so cool, such a unique experience. Airport security to get in. I'm not sure how much I'm allowed to talk about that though, so I won't say much more on it, but yeah, managed to explore those different sort of psychiatric subspecialties clinically. But what I also did on these days was attend um, some of the more leadership and management style meetings that um, Dr. Tracy as medical director attends day to day to kind of get a sense of what leadership's like in the NHS and what it really means to inspire culture within your team. And then aside from all of this, because I can't sit still, um, I also spent two days at the Royal College of Psychiatrists. I attended some meetings for committees that I sat on um, and two or three days I was back at BMA House um, in the BMJ offices helping out with BMJ student and recording for our podcast Sharp Scratch, which shameless plug, sorry, um, is a podcast that teaches you everything you need to know to be a good doctor that med school doesn't teach you. I always think of it as we're your friends in the year above who are offering you kind of colloquial advice about med school and um, we're on Spotify or Apple Pods or kind of wherever you get your podcasts but essentially what I kind of wanted my message from my talk to be today is that you can really think outside the box when planning your elective it doesn't have to resemble your med school placements um, there are so many really cool things that run parallel to medicine we've got so many skills that we get from learning to be doctors that are so transferable if I, I hone in on the communication side of things that we're drilled in and it's drilled into us at Manchester and I think that's what really runs parallel with journalism in particular um but yeah journalism might not be your area of interest that it was just mine but you probably do have areas of interest that that you'd be able to explore I've I know someone who's doing their elective this year with the Labour Party. I know someone who did their elective, I think someone in the year above us, Anna, did their, their elective with the Love Island medical team. 
So there are really cool things that you can do that you might not have ever thought of. And my experience is the worst thing anyone can say is no, if you ask people. So just cold, send cold emails, ask people questions. I don't know. Um, I did just say that journalism might not have been your cup of tea, but if it is, um, the BMJ do a Clegg scholarship, which um, runs every year. It's our kind of summer internship program. There's a competitive application process to it, but essentially you get to join the BMJ student team um, and I, you get funding for it. I think you get about a grand. It works out to be um, for the number of hours of work that you do. It's like London living wage for that. Um, and applications for this are normally over winter, so they probably will open around Christmas time. Interviews happen just in the new year, and we normally aim for people to know if they've got a place by kind of March. So it, we they do kind of time it to fit with your elective should you want it to. Um, and it tends to be super flexible to your interests and what you want to do. It's actually how I know Penny, because she was one of my Clegg scholars the year that I was running the scheme um, two years ago. Like me, Penny was a little hard done by because BMA house was closed. We didn't get to do anything in person. Um, but I know that last year's cohort um, got up to lots of really fun and cool things. So if you are interested in writing, medical writing, research, journalism, do look up the Clegg Scholarship. It will be on the MJ students' websites or handle like Twitter, Instagram, things like that. Or you can message me and I can, or Penny, because she's applied successfully to it before dropping you in there, Penny. But yeah, basically my kind of take home message is think outside the box and we do enough placement anyway. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Nikki. That that was so enlightening. I just love how you were just like, yeah, I just asked Channel 4 and they were like, cool with it. I think that's amazing. Honestly, I have such respect for you for that. Um, but yeah, that's such an interesting take on Do your you have life. to say with things like that, though, it's like you've got to you can't just send random like harassing messages. Not that that's what anyone would do. True. But like <laughs> I, I mean, when I emailed, I sent this is my CV. This is my writing sample. This is my like reference from people who have done this kind of thing with before this is why I want to do it this is when I can do it is it possible it's kind of you don't expect to get a response to these things but I mean sometimes you do so yeah yeah a, a little bit of experience you have in a cold email can go a long way as well so just try and give them a reason to respond as well okay Anna it's your turn. Have I got your slides? Do you want me to share for you? Or do yeah, you want to share your own? Yeah, you've got my slides. I think it might be easier if you do it. My wife you might have to do a Chris Whitty. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. There we go. Um, that, yeah, that'll be it. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'll just reintroduce myself for those who weren't here. So my name's Anna. I am the med student lead for DUK and I'm also a final year at Manchester. Um, I did my elective in the Caribbean. Um, I looked at a bunch of places. I looked at going to Australia, which was my ideal, but because we were the sort of COVID, will they, will they not year? Um, the, it didn't really work in terms of visas and quarantining and that sort of stuff. I also looked at doing mine with the F1 team, but I think it was really hard logistically to figure out the sort of like, flights and that sort of thing but that is an option they do take medical students if anyone is interested in formula one because i'm an absolute nut for it so yeah uh yes yeah, so i don't mind the caribbean next slide please <laughs> so i have clicked it give me a second i don't know why it's been there we go so yeah, this is where I did mine. It's called St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's just below Barbados. And it is basically a total hidden gem. Um, no one really knows about it. It's not very touristy, which I'm not really sure why, because it's amazing. And to be honest, primarily the reason we chose it because it was English speaking. Um, it was part of like one of the UK colonies until about 30 years ago. So it was also the ease of it. Like we didn't have to get visas. We knew like we'd be okay. Like everyone spoke English. So it was, I took the easy way out with this one fully. Um, but it is a tiny place. So the population's one, one of 104,000, which is like a, like a large UK town. And most people live in the mainland of, if you can see on the map um, of St. Vincent, and then there's 32 little islands. So Vincentians live on the mainland and then the Grenadines are just, full of tourists like I think Princess Margaret lived in one of them for a while like I think Will and Kate have a house in one of them like it's a very touristy little island but then the actual mainland is like where proper Vincentians live um, and you've probably all actually seen it before because it's where Paris the Caribbean was filmed so yeah fun fact uh, next slide please 
Thank you. So I was reminiscing making these PowerPoints and just slideshows and photos of how lovely it really is. It's honestly one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to. Um, and these were just like places that you'd wander down. Like we've got a boat to um, Tobago Keys, which is one of the amazing islands and the sunsets are just beautiful. It's honestly the most incredible place. Um, and it has really drastic landscapes from like beautiful beaches, like these amazing waterfalls. And that's predominantly because it's like quite a volcanic um, like island. Um, it actually has loads of explosions at the moment. So yeah, yeah, it was a really beautiful place, I'm sure you can all see. Next slide, please. So this is the actual medical part of my talk, which I will get to. So we started by actually doing a blood drive and it is volunteer run because basically there is no blood on the island. Um, they don't have any reserves. And so they run these blood drives every three, four times a year to try and build some sort of stock. We spent one morning with them, so from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m., and we got 12 successful donors. We were like, oh gosh, we sort of, we sort of failed them, didn't we? didn't do that well. They said it was the most successful blood drive they've ever had in over a decade. So it really shows that it makes such a difference. What we think is normal, having like 12 bags of blood is unheard of over there. Um, and one of the reasons for that is everyone's really worried about getting HIV. And there's a huge social stigma around it when realistically, I don't think the rates are any higher than Manchester, to be fair. But it's this, it's been so over-influenced within society that it's become this like over-inflated issue. And just to sort of prove how valuable blood is, um, that week there was a surgery that happened and it was a man who was shot by a shotgun. And I didn't know this, but apparently a shotgun explodes in place of fragments and it's inside you. So you had hundreds and hundreds of like wounds everywhere. And he used four of those bags of blood of the 12. So a third of the six month supply was used in one man who actually died on the table. So it's really imperative to have. Um, and unfortunately stories like this aren't uncommon. So everyone has a gun. Uh, I think weed is one of their biggest exports and they can drink dry. So, you know, those three put together makes for a lot of crashes, a lot of shotgun wounds, like these sorts of things. So unfortunately the need for blood is absolutely paramount, but it's just not happening. So how they typically get like blood for surgeries is they'll say to the relatives, if you want your brother, sister, mother, father to have this surgery, you need to donate the blood for them. And that's sort of how it works over there, which is so different from what we have over here. But yeah, next slide, please. We were also able to sit in medical clinics. I don't actually have any photos of me in scrubs except for one with a cat. So, but I did not do a veterinary science degree, I promise. So yeah, this was um, medical clinics we sat in. Um, we worked in the private healthcare sector purely because the public one is so overrun and under, understaffed, underfunded, they actually didn't have time for us. So we were seeing private clinics more so. Um, the healthcare appointments cost over like the average daily wage of one Vincentian. So they had to pay a lot for them, even though it was about 20 pounds per appointment. And the appointments, because they were paid for, were basically like full body MOTs. Like every woman coming in over 40 had a breast exam. Everyone like had their tummy felt, everyone had like a full neurological exam. It was a full MOT. I think a part of that is to do with the fact that it is like private healthcare and it it's a lot of money for them. It's actually like you should get your money's worth. And so then you have like sports medicine doctors who we were fortunate enough to see. Um, he was actually the, I think he was head of the Olympic committee for 20 years in the Caribbean. So like a super specialist, someone you would never get to see in the UK in the NHS. And he was out there doing like, abdo exams for like some with constipation and like neuro exams some with headaches so specialists become gps out there effectively um another thing we also saw was obs and gynae clinics which is really interesting especially as i have quite an interest in that and there were two key issues like societal issues that sort of bled into healthcare here so one was lack of funding which wasn't really a surprise for us um so for example we had a woman who was having twins one was breech and one was transverse so she obviously needed a c-section but she was being told it's going to happen under general anesthetic and i was like oh is this because of the position of the babies and the doctor replied saying no we've run out of spinal needles we haven't had spinal needles for over two years in this country and just because it's like lack of funding it's such a poor country and it's so remote that like planes aren't easy to land there which doesn't help the other one is an issue that I'm going to talk more on, on the next slide and something that I actually found quite challenging um, and it was that um, basically a child 14 year old child was brought in by her mum because she was seen holding hands of someone on the island and her mum brought her in to the doctor to ask for a speculum to check if she was if she was still a virgin um, so that was a highly problematic case that we all found quite shocking so next slide please 
So like that was one of the key societal issues that we weren't really expecting to sort of bleed into healthcare. I feel like in the NHS, you keep your views like societally very separate from like healthcare, whereas that didn't really happen over there. Like I was absolutely shocked that an Obzangani doctor did a speculum to check someone was still a virgin, considering that's not even like scientifically accurate. But it was done and we sort of had, we, we left and didn't see it. Um, but those are the sorts of things you do see. And I think it's quite important to highlight that. Um, for example, other views that are really like, we don't agree with is that like homosexuality is illegal over there. Any behavior causes five years in jail. And surprise, surprise, it's a very patriarchal place with women paid less than men, expected to do the cleaning, the childcare, this sort of stuff. And so it was quite different to see that. Um, and I think it was something that I didn't think I would see as much as I did considering I was in clinics a lot um I you thought you'd see it on the street rather than in a doctor's office so what the advice I would have for that is that it's a good thing to see in so many ways because it teaches what you learn over here like we're so grateful for the NHS and I think I'm more so now because of what I've seen over there um but what I would say is that actually going with a like a westernized company can be really helpful if you know that like the views and the place you want to go to are not the views that you hold for example I don't hold any of the views that these like the Vincentians believe in then going with an American company that well, like we did was a lot easier because it means that the person who owns the company will employ people who have the same views as you or are able for you to talk about it and not say anything um and that became a lot easier. So if anyone's, if like an employee said something to us that we found to be like quite, I don't know, misogynistic, we could say it and it would get dealt with rather than being expected to get on with it because that's the cultural way of that country. So I never thought I'd say it, but actually going with like a more westernized country and paying that extra money can be really helpful if you want to go somewhere that you know doesn't hold the same belief system as you. So next slide, please. So that was really heavy as a, conversation so I put some nice photos on here um yeah it's just it's a beautiful place I'd really recommend the Caribbean it's so diverse it's also stunningly warm we went through monsoon monsoon season and like you can't even see any of it like it was beautiful I think also another thing to point out is like you make friends for life over there um like these girls are all from Manchester and I know them really well now we have cheese and wine far too often probably because of it but it is definitely worth it um I think electives are a really good opportunity no matter where you go just to really explore and see different things um next slide please and if you are going to go to the Caribbean I would recommend going over carnival season so carnival is a month long which I did not know and on the final day they have this huge Mardi Gras parade which was the night before our flight so we were incredibly hung over for our flight but it was worth it and yeah so if you're going to go to the Caribbean go during like carnival season that's it. So I think my email's on the next page. So yeah, if you have any questions, if you want to talk about the Caribbean or anything like that, just drop me a message. But yeah, thank you very much, guys. Awesome. Thank you, Anna. That's really interesting. You brought up some really interesting issues that I didn't have in my elective at all. Um, you know, Thailand's quite a free country. Like there's not too many issues around um, things like that. And I certainly didn't come across those in Thailand. So that's, that's really interesting that you've brought those up. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it is interesting. I think going to somewhere that I was English speaking and was like British mm. be, like a few decades ago, I thought yeah. it would be, I didn't think it would be like that. So it was an interesting experience and how we've all had such different experiences for the same remit in many ways. Yeah, that's so, that's so awesome. Um, yeah. Were there many med students with you? Did you go alone or did you go with someone? So yeah, we went as, there was three of us girls went and then oh. we found out that three other girls were going from Manchester and then we found out that five other girls from Manchester were also going, and then a group of four boys. So it was 12 Manchester medics in one house. Excellent. That's amazing. Wow. I'm lot. sure you had a good time. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Anna, for talking. And we'll hear from you again in a little bit to talk about DA UK stuff. But now we're going to get down to the nitty gritty stuff, which is the cost of the elective. Um, so, yeah, this is... This is going to be very independent to you personally organising your elective. If you stay in the UK, um, there's different fees associated with that. You might have to you you might be able to live at home and commute to your local hospital and do your elective that way, and that's going to be significantly cheaper. However, some people do want to go abroad, and sometimes you might have financial barriers to this, so you need to find funding, especially for flights, which have gone up recently. Um, the cost of living's gone up recently, so. You know, I don't think many people have savings for this kind of thing or don't anticipate that they'll need savings for an elective. 
Um, I'm certainly on the side that, you know, your university should really be providing this kind of funding. Um, so definitely, if your university isn't providing you help and isn't providing you those bursaries, definitely get in touch with them and tell them about this problem. Because that might help the university allocate more funding towards a medical elective. And it's just another thing to remember that your medical elective is a compulsory part of your degree. Um, so it's easier to get funding when something is a compulsory part of your degree. So just keep that in mind, you know, it's you're not going away for an internship or a holiday. It is part of your degree to go somewhere else and have these experiences. So definitely don't feel guilty about it. If you if you want to get if you've got a good enough idea, you should be able to get it funded some way, one way or another. I'm not saying it will be easy, but hopefully if you apply to enough places, someone's going to give you a yes eventually. Um, so let's think about the costs involved. So this is kind of based on my experience. So um, Nikki and Anna, please feel free to butt in and tell me any costs that you guys had experiences that you're happy sharing. Um, but these were my uh, costs that I had. So I had to pay elective programme fees and that included fees to the actual hospital I was in and also academic fees to the university. And that's like an academic fee might be access to their libraries, access to their journals, um, access to like the university email, like stuff like that, that you don't really think about until you're actually on the elective and realize you can't print anything or you can't use the, the, the Wi-Fi in the hospital. So just something to think about is worth paying the fee if you can afford it. Um, the other thing is obviously flights, fuel costs have gone up. So flights are, uh, quite extortionate at the moment I will warn people so if you are going abroad it is the main bulk of your expenses will be your flights most likely um remember you'll also have to get to the place that you're working at so that might be public transport and you also have to um, get a visa in some countries as well so it's definitely worth checking the visa requirements before you start organizing and planning this magical elective and realize you, you're not going to be able to get a visa to cover that time and um, so just look up how much it costs to get the visa if there's any requirements or like any paperwork you need for that because sometimes it can be a bit of a nightmare for thailand it was very straightforward it was just like an online application and you just typed in um e-visa for thailand and it was quite straightforward i think it was it wasn't too expensive i think it was 30 pounds of thailand but don't quote me on that um but the flights were definitely the most expensive thing about that and um, you've also got food and accommodation um your nhs bursary does cover abroad accommodation up to a certain amount um per week so you can look into that um so you know if you've got no idea where this funding is coming from you can look into like your nhs bursary sort of funding as well which does cover a bit but it might not cover everything and again there's like specific nuances about that so definitely read the small print on the nhs bursary website um remember you've also got to have your travel vaccines and some vaccines are not provided on the nhs so tb is not provided in the nhs anymore you have to spend about 50 pounds to get that privately done um, or you can get a doctor like waiver saying oh we don't have this in the uk or such and such but um, it's definitely something to talk to the hospital that you're you're going to be working at what the TB status is like in that uh, in that community because it, it might be that you might have to avoid like the respiratory wards or that you know you have to get vaccinated so just be careful be aware of that and um, so for Thailand I had to have my um, dengue fever and I think typhoid yeah I had to have typhoid and dengue fever and um, before I went over there and that was a requirement from occupational health some areas obviously you've got to think about malaria prep you might want to think about taking some HIV post prophylaxis with you and um, just in case you do get a needle stick and you're in the middle of nowhere and um, there's no occupational health out you know in a random island somewhere so you, you're going to have to take that stuff with you and think about what you're going to do if you do get a needle stick and also think about working within your competencies like should you even be doing like needle stick excess, you should, should you even be taking blood from someone or such and such? So just need to think about that in your risk assessment, and um, which most universities require now. You will also, most providers do ask for you to have student indemnity. Um, I'm not employed by MDU, but I just went with MDU because it, it was free at the time and they made effort to get me free stuff. So I went with MDU, but please do your own research and choose the, your own indemnity cover. Um, that's just in case anything goes wrong. Usually you're under complete supervision the whole time. So but it's just worth having it, um, the documentation in case the providers do ask for it. Now you want a bit of a travel budget as well, because you're not just going to be sitting, going to the hospital and coming home. You're going to want to enjoy the country that you're in or have a bit of money left over for enjoyment and things generally, because otherwise you will be a bit miserable. So do have a little bit of budget just to go and see them, some things, even if it's only at the weekend or such and such. Do not bring polyester to a very hot country. It is not the same as the UK. You'll sweat and you'll like pass out like it's not worth it. Um, definitely research what type of clothing you should be wearing and don't come like 
underprepared like I did I had a complete shock and had to like borrow clothing from like my Thai relatives and things so no polyester if you're going to a hot country it is sweltering trust me on that one um, now, some companies do offer like elective arrangement fees. Now, these are a bit dubious depending on how much you want to spend. Again, um, you know, there's different benefits of that. You know, it might be an all inclusive package and you might not have to like put much effort into it and like it's all there ready for you. Um, however, some of them can be a bit exploitative. So you might be paying £3,000 for an elective and it might be not as ethically sound as you thought it was. So my advice would be do your research and talk to somebody who's done that elective and who's been on that company. They might have had a really good experience or they might have just felt like they've been ripped off. So definitely talk to somebody who's done the experience that you're wanting to do. And of course, plans prevent poor performance. And these things take a lot of planning. OK, here's my uh, summary slide. Feel free to take a screenshot of this. If you just um, don't remember anything I say, just take a screenshot of it. Um, the first thing you should go for for funding wise. Um, now, some of these. Uh, broad electives can cost thousands of pounds I will put that out there you know it's, it's up to you how much you want to try and get funded and how much you want to do that's that's all individual to you so these are just ideas that you can do to get some of that um, funding um, so the first thing to do is uh, talk to your medical school um, internal funding is the easiest way because they, they know your record and things and um, it's a lot easier to go through the internal funding route before you try and get external funding which is often the more competitive um, so your university might have research awards or clinical awards or have certain money ring fence for certain projects. I, I don't know if it's true for like Manchester or other universities, but at Leeds, there's like a project. If you do an elective on like women's health, you can get this 500 pound award. Or if you do it specifically on research, you get 500. So it's just knowing about these nuances, little things and seeing if you can get your project into any of these boxes that have these awards that come with them. Um, UK wide touring, touring funding. Um, so that is um, like a UK scheme to help people go and study abroad. And it's also open to medical students doing their elective. Um, it's a limited number per uni. So definitely talk to your uni early about this. Um, it's not a competitive process, but I think they just do it by like means testing. Um, so just have a talk to your university about that. I know there was like 40 places last year at Leeds and they had lots of money left over. And, you, you know, everyone who needed one got one. Um, and you can see that in the box up in the right hand corner, how much they did provide. And the that amount is quite good if you're actually in like a, if you've got your flights covered and then you only have to use that amount to get um, food and accommodation. It actually went quite far in terms of Thailand as well. It did help me out a lot because the living cost was actually quite low. I managed to get um, they do cover flights as well. So they were able to cover my flights and also um, have a bit towards like food and living expenses. So. Um, it's definitely worth getting into. Oh, go back. There we go. Um, the other thing is, is that the Royal Colleges are have have a lot of um, grants and things available for medical students. Um, it's worth signing up to these if you're interested in a certain specialty. So um, the Royal College of Edinburgh have like 200 to two, uh, 500 pounds um, available for certain projects and things. Now, these tend to be a bit more competitive, but um, they can just help add towards your, your pot of money. There's also some medical associations for different religious and ethnic groups, um, which if you're in these circles, you can kind of, um, they might sponsor you if you write to them or if you are if you go to their website and see if they've got anything on offer for, for members of that particular religious or ethnic group. So it's worth having a look into. I know the Christian Medical Fellowship is one to look out for. There's one that sponsors Asian research specifically. These are very nuanced things that you find on the Royal Society of Medicine's webpage. So definitely have a dig. Um, there's also the Amgen Scholar Exchange Programme, which is actually an exchange programme run by um, Amgen, which is a really big pharmaceutical company. So it is worth looking into some of these as well that can provide really actually good quality programmes. Um, so it's worth looking into that for your elective. I'm pretty sure you can do that as your elective as well, and that it comes with some funding. So it's sort of a two in one, and that's more of a research based scholarship, uh, research based elective. Um, some charities will also um, consider sponsoring you if you just write to them. Again, the worst thing they can say is no. Um, it's always worth sending letters. Um, you know, you've got Heart Research UK, you've got a British Heart Foundation, you've got all these big charities who want to give money to the right people. So if you're doing, say, a research project in that area, it might be a great opportunity for you to get some grant writing skills in and also maybe do an elective in that area and help them out a bit or in a different country. Um, down the bottom, I'd say crowdfunding because it's not very 
it's very difficult to do crowdfunding right. You know, you've got to set an appropriate limit on your crowdfunding and do it all the right way. If you are doing it this way, please just please just be transparent about it, about where the money's going, where any money that's left over is going. So just be careful about, you know, how you put things because they can backfire very easily on um, Twitter, especially med Twitter these days. Um, and just a few do's and don'ts. It's OK to apply for more than one award. Um, it's not OK to apply for the same thing twice. So as in, say, if I applied to one pot of money, oh, can you pay for my flights? And then I applied for another one saying, oh, can you also pay for my flights? That's not acceptable. So just keep that in mind. Um, when you're applying to these things, apply for their different things. So it's OK to make it up to um, your full expenses. So, oh, this charity covered my flights or this and this charity covered my maintenance fees. But just be very clear and very transparent about how much funding you've got from where just so there's no crossover and you're being completely transparent. Um, and the last thing is just write letters to company. I wrote a lot of letters. I wrote to Vasco Society. I wrote to um, Gord, like a vascular med tech company. You know, you never know. Somebody might say yes. I got a lot of no's, but I did manage to get my elective like fully funded in the end from the Royal College of Surgeons and from the chairing funding and stuff. So the worst answer you're going to get is no. So it's definitely, you know, get out there, get writing letters. Um, and thank you so much for listening, guys. Um, Anna, you're up now. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Can I say one quick thing about getting funding? Just so yeah. that everyone's aware for, for future, if you want to publish, if you want to write with like an editor hat on, sometimes you have to declare if certain, especially if pharmaceutical companies yeah. have paid, for, even if they paid for your flights for your elective, sometimes if you then write an article about something to do with, yeah. like something to do with hearts and you've got, do you know what I mean? Like you sometimes have to declare it as a conflict of interest. So it's just something to be aware of. It doesn't mean you shouldn't do it at all, yeah. but it's just something to be aware of that you will probably, you might, if you ever end up in writing, publishing, especially in research, you do have to declare conflicts of interest if you've ever taken money from companies. Rural colleges and stuff are normally fine. Like mm. we don't have to declare. Yeah, pharmaceutical companies. But pharmaceutical companies, you would yeah. definitely have to declare. So it's worth remembering that. Yeah. That's a really good point. Not that it would be held against you, but you just have to declare you it. You have to declare it, yeah. And on the note of funding, in terms of the cheering scheme, I remember when we were on our elective, it changed for Manchester. So I think it's very much a changing thing because yeah. originally it was only a select few were getting it and then it became everyone got an email being like, hi, do you want £400? And as we were all Manchester medics, like a bunch of people got different emails with, depending on like family, like circumstances. Yeah. But, it is changing um, and it changes on a yearly basis, I think, depending on how big their pot of money is. So yeah. it's definitely worth keeping an eye on, but I'm not sure if that could go up or down or... Yeah, know. that's definitely the point. And these figures are just for this year. So just keep checking it. Um, talk to your university. Every university should have a dedicated touring scheme like representative. So that's a really good point. Uh, con a contact of um, someone you can contact. Um, yeah. I know okay. to find that note tomorrow, so I wouldn't worry. But yeah. Um, so yeah, obviously, um, as me and Penny are DUK people, um, we ask you to join the DUK. So here is a QR code to, to join us. Um, it's free membership for medical students. You get 10% of Quest Med, 20% of Geeky Medics. And you get an access to like a really large DUK community that we're very friendly. We're all quite activists, I think, with a very much changing world at the moment in terms of like the BMA strikes and stuff. It's nice to have people who want to like rally for the same things and lobby for the same things. And it's nice having people in your corner with that sort of voice. So yeah, and there's our Instagram and our Twitter, but we're a lovely bunch if you want to come join us. Um, and membership is free and you get access to all these sorts of events um, and it helps us run these. Um, and you get some, it's actually technically free, like not even free, it's like you get discounts. So it's positive money, really. It's positive, it's a win-win. It's, it's a win-win. Yeah, and I think in terms of elective closing things, like you will work for the rest of your life, which I think I'm really realizing now in fifth year, which I re really wish I realized earlier on. Like, we will be working for so long, and that's not really optional. It's like a love it or hate it that will be happening. So use your elective, like it's time, it's compulsory time, but like use it to enjoy yourself. Like, go where you want to do, do what you want to do, like take the risk, take the plunge, mm. send those messages. I think that's like the overarching theme is just 100%. You'll work until you're like 65. Don't feel like you have to work your absolute socks off if you don't want to. <laughs> do something you want to do. Like love it. You love it. Love. Um, and just go for it. It's so worth it. I think we all had like the best summers of our lives. We did. Um, just while we're chatting, guys, if you've got any questions, this is our little QA bit. So we're happy to answer any questions. Please note everything is recorded. So if you don't want to be recorded, um, just feel free to use our emails and we'll 
most of us will be happy to answer you offline or on Twitter or such and such. And um, so just type your questions in. I'll give you a few minutes to like type anything in. But again, you can I think you can put in anonymous questions if you don't want us to like know who you are, which is fair enough. Um, I think so we've got yeah. some already, Penny. So I have got some asking where would you recommend getting scrubs from? What do you think oh, is oh, OK. You can get some from Amazon, but I just got them when I was abroad. Um, the team actually bought me some. Um, I think sometimes it's better to go to the country that you're in and then figure out that they have they often have a good supply of what you need over there in that country and often at a cheaper rate I bought like a cotton coat of Amazon and I quickly realized it was a very very bad decision I should have just waited and got like one of the nice light silk tie coat um, tie medical coats when I went out there and I would have saved money that way yeah what we did for ours we used our like we get scrubs from medical school so we used those but it was too hot to walk in so we'd walk in like gym gear change when we were there when it was aircon and do that um so you can get round it if your place is aircon is what i'd say um oh penny could you repeat that about declaring in terms of the finances i think that was nikki nikki's uh the qualified one on oh, this oh, uh, sorry. <laughs> i did put the editor <laughs> I probably didn't explain it very well um it's more for the future it's not that any of us uh, well I guess so if you're publishing original research or if you're commenting on other people's research in journals like the BMJ the Lancet things like that you will need to declare a conflict of interest if so for example say if you've been um paid in the past by a company that's got something to do with a certain type of medication and then a study comes out about that medication you couldn't I think for the BMJ, you couldn't write an editorial about that particular thing if you've been paid by that company before. It's just something to be conscious of in terms of like where your funding is coming from. Um, if you are if you are wanting to be someone who in the future is publishing, commenting on things involved in research, a lot of the time you can still write those things. You just have at the bottom of the article where it says your name, it will say conflict of interest for example when all of the UK FPO drama was happening when I was at the BMJ and I was writing the news stories all of my um, news articles at the bottom say conflict of interest the author will graduate in the year that is affected by these changes something like that because it might have made me slightly biased to write those things so it's just one of those things that you've got to be aware of when accepting money from a company sometimes you will have to declare that in the future doesn't mean you should or shouldn't just something to be aware of i hope that's slightly better explained than before yeah perfect thank you nikki um okay so one as someone has asked what company would you recommend for a caribbean elective so Ooh. i'm with i went with medical electives abroad and it was a very new company when i turned up there mm. were some teething issues i won't lie um i think it'd be one of those things that shop around for them but I sometimes think it is worth going with like a company um for them so the reason I thought although in in hindsight I'm really glad we went with them don't get me wrong there were the teething issues however it was very good and we were we had like two people assigned to us so we had a guy and a girl um Rodney and Shanique and they were basically just for us to help us so like when they would show us the sites like help us walk around and even like Shanique on the first day took all the girls out just around Kingstown which is the capital and the guys were cat calling at us I mean someone yelled you you look pale and I was like I know Whoa. um but she, and she was like teach us like how to respond to that so as a woman it was really helpful having that and I actually wouldn't trade that for anything because there was no point where I didn't feel safe and I knew how to get on the bus and I knew how like the etiquette for things so although it was a lot more expensive doing it with that us compared to another group who were on the exact same island had a better time because we went with them so they were medical electives abroad I'm not going to say it's perfect there were some absolute teething issues with the company but it was good and the guy who runs it it's a bit nep like nepotism wise like he the guy who runs it his dad is like best friends with the health minister um so you can get like you can get some proper change done if you want to like the person there was loads of Manchester medics but there's one from Newcastle and one from Cambridge the one from Newcastle did nine weeks out there and he was setting up an ambulance system like he was they, they don't have ambulances they have cars that transport you and it's just a transport. this is why we have CV inflation <laughs> yeah. and he was like teaching them oh, like, yes and like what to have in a van like what wow. would actually be life-saving and how to put on a tourniquet and like we were all helping him create this document for this sort of stuff so 
it is a very good company if you want to make some real change it's also quite a good company if you don't really want to do that much because they will let you do what you want to do um so yeah i would i'd partially recommend them if you want to go to st vincent and the grenadines um they were good and it was probably worth the money in hindsight because i felt safe especially as a woman mm-hmm. um in a where you get catcalled every which way but um there were loads of places some people went to barbados had a brilliant time i think it was more touristy um than st vincent um other people nikki will know where did other people, st lucia people went to didn't they and they had a good time as well, but again, a bit more touristy. So it depends on whether you want to go to like a more touristy island like Barbados and St Lucia that doesn't have these issues and you probably pay less. Or you want to go somewhere like St Vincent, which has these issues, is I personally think better to go to because it's less touristy, but you do have to therefore invest in like a company sort of looking after you over there. Mm. It's trying to balance it all out. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point, Anna, yeah. But it's good that they make you feel so supportive as well, especially when you're like on your own in a different country. It can be quite yeah. scary, kind of. I think it wasn't even like guys would be on you like on like on the bus like straight yeah. there and she was like you but she would tell you how to deal with that and like there was yeah. a guy on the bus next to me it's a very jolty bus by the way and he has just a big machete and I was like oh my gosh but it's like and she teaches you how to deal with this and I said like, that's so important because otherwise I would have like freaked um so okay, it, nice uh, question. yeah um would you recommend visiting the Caribbean alone um yes I would so there were two people who went alone so one from Cambridge one from Newcastle and they did it both alone they loved it because you meet other people if you go with a company mm. you meet other people out there especially in the Caribbean I think if you're going to go and do it by yourself and like go to an Airbnb I can see it being a lot more lonely unless you're in hospital a lot more but then mm-hmm. like you went by yourself Penny and had a fab time yeah that's the thing I think it depends like you will find people who are just traveling who are the same age as you yeah. who if you both speak English you'll suddenly become friends like I was sitting on the bus I met like five English teachers out in Thailand and you know, it was like we were friends by the end of the train journey. So people are like more friendly than you think. Um, it's not like this English culture where we don't talk to each other and we sort of in London where you just sort of ignore each other and you push past each other. Sorry, Nikki, but it's true. It's true. Um, you know, people are friendly. Like if you chat to them, you'll make friends really quickly. A lot of people are in the same situation as you or have come out to teach English in another country. So there's definitely loads of people around for you to make friends with. And there's probably other medical students around who have also come to do their elective there. So definitely put yourself out there, but also prioritise your safety, of course, as well. Yeah, I think if you're going to go alone, then and if you're going to a dodgy place, do your research a bit more, maybe go with Yeah, do your research. Where yeah. like these two individuals will put with us and then we like unfriend them for life now sort of thing. So, um, but the Caribbean is amazing to go to. I do recommend. Um, sh- we, yeah, we share our email addresses. So I'm just going to this. How do we apply to the Turing scheme via the uni or on their website separately? So each uni should have a Turing like representative. So you need to talk to your funding department in your university and say, do you have somebody who's in charge of your Turing funding? And can I have their contact details, please? Um, you don't usually apply independently in this unless your university is completely useless. Hopefully that is not the case for anybody like at medical school here. Um, but yeah, I think just get in touch through your, like internally through your medical school, because they should know, they should know, because they, they have, this is a problem that they should have every year. Like they should know the answers to these questions, you know. Yeah, no, definitely. They're there to help you. Um, it does get busy just before your elective time where everyone realizes oh my gosh you've got to pay for this so if you have any queries get there yeah later. don't leave it to the last minute because funding does not just come out of the woodwork after a week you know it might take a week for you to be paid it might take a month for you to be added to payroll and like to get that money added like through the Turing scheme and there's certain documents you've got to do like at set time so just just be ahead of it and just yeah, yeah keep on top of it yeah and make sure you read what you need before you go so yes we have to sign off we have to get a stamp and like yeah. a deal of approval on this we didn't know it but yeah like, we'll I had to do that there. but yeah 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 with okay. that um emails from there does and en- does anyone know anyone that is elected in Canada I don't have any contacts but would love to do one there I do not have I think Nikki for- do you know anyone I know someone who had oh. an elective organised in Canada, but it got cancelled because of oh, no. COVID. It was a psychiatry elective. I can put you in touch with that med, that I think she's a foundation doctor now, but I can put you in touch with her if you drop me an email, whoever asked that question, I'll put my email address in the chat. So if, if you're interested in psychiatry in Canada, I think it was in Vancouver that she'd organised it off the top of my head, but I could be wrong. But as I say, she worked quite hard to organise that and it got cancelled. Oh, of that's COVID. so sad. So maybe it could go to good use yes um yeah. I think someone's asked for your email but it's, I think it's in the chat it's so in the chat yeah yeah 
Um, okay, if someone wants to copy the slides, if you email us, because we'll put the live um, recording out, but if you want the slides specifically, just drop us an email and we'll send them to you. I'm sure we'll all be okay with that. There's nothing. Yeah, that's that's fine. I'll yeah. put all the slides and everything. Um, that will be all right. And then are there, were there any things that you have to do well in advance? Oh, I mean, yeah, flights. You, you need your flights booked well in advance, I'd say. Um, and yeah, I think I'd say your planning just needs to be done early because if you're going to go somewhere, it does take months to plan these things. Because remember, you've got to get a visa, you've got to get the flights, then you've got to secure the grants, like the funding. So you do have to think about what you're doing. And, you know, um, if you're contacting supervisors and stuff, they might not reply straight away. They might take two weeks or they might be on holiday. Um, so you've got to give like yourself time to sort things out, but also the people that you're supposed to be supervising you as well. So the earlier you do things, the easier and the smooth sailing it's going to be for you. Yeah, I do. I, I totally agree. However, our elective with COVID at Manchester, it was very up in the air. So they were going to it was like you usually put in your application like Christmas time. And then they said, no, we're not going to because of COVID. And it was only actually allowed to go ahead. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's like March time. So I think it was April was the deadline, like the start of April. That was it. Start of April. I mean, they didn't approve mine for until like oh weeks gosh. before we start. I mean, I was like, I was only going to London. I was renting a room from a friend of a friend in London. So I could have pulled out of that worst case scenario. But if I'd been going abroad, if they were funny with mine, I think, because of the fact that it was non-clinical and clinical and they wanted to make sure I was doing at least 50% clinical so that's something I didn't mention actually check if your uni has any requirements if you're thinking outside the box make sure you tick their boxes make sure yeah <laughs> yeah that's a good point so, uh, yeah. although yes it's good to do it in advance I started I started looking at mine in February and I left in end of May June so like you can do it last minute which is not ideal but we had to because they weren't even sure we we're going to do it you didn't have a choice did you so, no, so yeah. I wouldn't worry too much and so th- I think this person says so they're asking if they need to do anything the year before I think in terms of a year before th- what I got the general gist of again we weren't even applying there because of like Australia America Canada would just like shut down I think they're those three are the hard ones to get in terms of visas and I think if you want to yeah. go to Australia America Canada look at visas really early because I think yeah. one of them has a six month application process yeah. something like that I think it might be Australia um mm. so I would look at those countries like a year early if you're looking at getting a visa um because that's the tricky part Mm. and the thing is some places might not accept you until they see the visa as well so just just keep that in mind because you know the whole thing is sort of a building block isn't it when you're trying to build this perfect elective and everything needs to fall into place and that goes to say like sometimes you don't get permission to go on your elective unless you've passed your exams so I didn't get permission to go on my elective until the 16th of July and I flew to Thailand on the 17th of July so you can imagine if I'd failed my exams that would have been a very expensive flight to not get on um so yeah just just keep that in mind and try not to stress yourself out too much with the dates so I probably should have left more of a week before um like you know don't um obviously do not book your elective anytime for your resets because you'll just put mentally like pressure on yourself as well just don't do it yeah um definitely not worth it um we actually got our results when we were out there and people were gonna have to oh, they failed and no one did thank goodness but no that's yeah. savage um, someone has asked, would you recommend booking flights in advance even before getting confirmation from the uni? Um, I mean, I did um, because I was quite like, I want to go. It depends. On, I think it depends if you're willing to take the financial risk and if you have insurance on those flights. If you have insurance, then you're going to get your money back. Then I'd say go for it. And it's also how much you're willing to like put the money down for it. Yeah, 100% get travel insurance, especially in this day and age with like COVID and every country has different rules and lockdowns. So definitely get um do your research. Yeah. And I, thought, much, I was going to say how much you're willing to fight for uni for what you want to do. It's true. Not yeah, fight, but yeah. do you mean like argue your case? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I, do, I agree with Mickey because they typically approve most electives, but they take a lot of time with paperwork. Like they went mm. to my but they take forever and a bloody day doing it, even though they've approved the same elective like so I went with a group of like end up being like six girls knew each other mine was approved two weeks after all of theirs even though theirs was the same as mine um so I did pay fully for my flights my accommodation everything before I even got mine approved but I was pretty sure I would because 
um, it was seen as like low risk. The uni have like something called an AIG map and it's a like an insurance thing for them to see how risky the country is for you. Um, and mine was green and I was like, so it was seen no risk. So I was like, they have no reason to say, no, I've got confirmation from the hospital. I've got confirmation from every, all these people. So I, I took a risk and I think it was, I totally would have to be fair. Um, and to be like the people who, cause we had in our year, I'm not sure about you, Penny, but lots of people who were going to go to Sri Lanka who couldn't because of oh, the yes. conflict. Yeah, we had that as well. And the people who had yeah. to cancel last minute, like they were refunded by like, is it ABTA, Abiturn, at all protected? Because it was like they could not go, like because of like the government said no. So I think if you're pretty, if your thing is, isn't like dodgy, if you're pretty sure it's going to get approved, I would... Oh, a solid idea, yeah. I would just go, for, like, I'd put like the money down and go for it because the uni can take forever with paperwork. Um, and then if you can't go for every reason, like you will go into a war-torn country, then the government will say no. And so, like, Atoll and Abita have to give you your money back. So, like, there is there is insurance there, like general insurance in case it goes wrong, like, you know, Sri Lanka have the civil war. Brilliant. Any other questions? Of course, we're happy to answer stuff like offline as well, if you don't want it answered in front of everyone. Um, is there any more questions? That's it from my side. Wow. Well done, guys. Amazing. Um, yeah, well, thank you for coming, everyone. Um, Anna, do you want a last plug for DA UK? <laughs> Yeah, again, QR code, give it a scan, takes like zero time. Um, and you get more events from me, Penny, and I'll probably drag Nikki into some more of these. So yeah. Brilliant. Thank you for having um, me. Thank you so much, Nikki. You've been amazing. Thank you for your unique perspective. Um, thank you, Anna, for your Caribbean perspective as well. And thank um, you so, yeah. for organizing this. It's been incredible. You've all found it very informative. Thank you. Um, I hope I'll get the recording up and let you guys know. But thank you so much and thanks for coming, everyone. Goodbye, good night. Good, good evening. Night.